Okay, well, welcome everyone to the podcast series. Uh, my name is Richard Owen. I'm the co-founder of OCS Cognition, and joining me today, my other co-founder, Brian Curry. And the topic we're going to be discussing today is really Brian's webinar that he did uh, earlier in the week, predicting revenue revenue predicting revenue retention with operational CX, a very well-attended revenue, uh, very well-attended webinar. So clearly a topic that's on a lot of people's minds. Thanks for joining me, Brian. You bet. You bet. It's my pleasure. Yeah, we had a, a lively conversation at the tail end of uh, the webinar. So uh, it was good to see some of the topics that really resonated with people and then also to kind of see some of the questions under the surface. So it'll be fun to talk about that today. Yes, yeah, so that's a good place to start. So the trend of companies focused on predicting more than just CX data, but also revenue data. Why why is this happening in your opinion? You know, I think it's it's uh, partially it's just the maturity of companies with CX projects. I think from the beginning, CX was really of interest to companies because they felt like, sure, on one hand, it's the, the best expression of value realization with customers, but they always, I think, saw it as underpinning their financial performance and, and the outcomes. And I think over time, they've grown a little weary of old style CX programs, which were often very difficult to connect with the financial metrics they were using in their operations throughout the rest of the business. You know, now, uh, as we're doing, we're really creating a situation where we're bringing some of the CX information on par with the financial information uh, in terms of data quality. And I think that's a big driver of it. I think just that possibility emerging is what's driving a lot of the interest. Yeah, so what you're saying is in part because it's more possible than it used to be. And so, you know, to some extent CX existed in its own vacuum and the data wasn't very good. So you couldn't really connect right. it to financials anyway. Um, yeah, I think it's I think it's an interesting topic because I think for the longest time, let's remember that NPS took off the start of the twenties, really because mm -hmm. executives said, "Here's a connection to financial outcomes. Here's a connection to growth. I want to care about this because of that." And a lot of people established NPS as a meet as an end of itself. That's the point. Let's just get to a better NPS goal. Um, and we seem to be seeing companies move on from that now, wouldn't you say? And it's saying, okay, that's good. We still get a lot of yeah. companies that care deeply about NPS, but they want to see where the money is. I think that's right. I think it's still a precursor to their interest, this notion that customer experience and metrics like Net Promoter will correlate with financial outcomes. And I think what, what the industry has asked them to do for the past 10 years is largely take that on faith. It's very difficult with very small survey driven sample sets that are coming once a year to really find those connections. Uh, but I think it was intuitive for most people to understand if we're doing a better job in the experiences our customers are having, uh, then it's gonna lead to better financial outcomes. I think now we have the ability to make those correlations much more directly. I think the other part of it to think about uh, is just that the financial metrics themselves aren't always that great. And even though they're really useful and they kind of as I said in the webinar, they reign supreme with companies. Uh, the anecdote I use there and that I like to use is if, you, if you're like me and you've ever run a business where you're in a, a kind of a lifetime value business, like a subscription business, you've undoubtedly seen these, these cohort charts on churn where we can stripe our, our, uh, our customers based on their born on date. And then we can look at the churn norms on the curve as they go over time. The traditional one is, Early periods, churn is low, it dips dramatically, it flattens out, and maybe as you introduce more features or you expand, you can reverse the churn circle. But it's oftentimes very difficult to understand why. It's just sort of, you know, you have to take it on faith sort of like gravity, that that's, it's predictive. Uh, why is really not diagnosed in that outcome. So I think when you bring CX together with financial data, you kind of get the best of both worlds because CX really bridges the financial outcomes to a lot of the operating motions that you're exercising and executing inside the company. Yeah, I mean, I think about it as the distinction between just correlation and causality in some ways, right? So you can draw a lot with churn analysis that says, here are the things that correlate to churn. <clears throat> but what's the mechanism by which somebody running a company can actually alter that outcome? And right. 
you know, we have this fundamental belief, and I think it's proven out in the data, that at the end of the day, companies drive operations. They, they run a business and they drive those operations and often they use key performance indicators or operational metrics or some sort of management control structure that they use to drive the car. And that enables them to goal their organization and their employees, hold everyone accountable. And those operational results change the attitudes of customers, hopefully favorably. Right. And the favorable behavior of customers directly impacts, not exclusively impacts, but directly impacts the financial outcomes, whether or not customers uh, churn out or whether they purchase more. And one of the tricky missing pieces, I think, Brian, has always been that connection because it's not perfect that promoters will be retained, right? Saying a customer right. is a promoter is not saying they're a guaranteed retention opportunity. No, not at all. And I think what, what we did when we started and what I think customers are beginning to get more and more interested with now is we, the first thing we did is we really solved the problem of very small and frequent data sets. And so we used really a machine learning approach to use predictive analytics to really fill in the gaps. So I could now see all of those people who didn't respond to my survey, I had a really trustworthy way to predict what their attitudes would be by, would be by looking at their operational data. Now I can, it, once I have a score for every customer, I can drill into very hyper-segmented parts of the business and see a score for every customer inside there. And that was just not possible before. But once we got into that rhythm, companies were more and more interested to see, particularly as customers were entering commercial periods where they were likely to renew something, rebuy, repurchase. Uh, could we actually shift from a prediction of the CX metric, maybe NPS or customer effort score, to an actual prediction of the financial outcome itself, like net recurring revenue or propensity to renew? Or could I dive in and look at um, high or low growth potential customers really sort of start to predict the financial metrics themselves. And while uh, we've just begun to do that work, it's actually very promising. As you might imagine, it's, it's the kind of thing that's likely to, to show some promise. Well, and it is to some extent the holy grail, certainly in B2B. If you think about it, what B2B leaders worry about is, am I going to lose an account when it comes up for renewal? It's a very simple question. And historically, right. the way you answered that question is you asked your team for an opinion. And the team volunteered a point of view, which was with the best will in the world, a guess, and mm -hmm. colored by a lot of personal biases because what, what do they want to tell their boss? Do they want to say that it's high risk because that might draw a lot of attention and potentially resources and cover them in the eventuality of something going wrong? Do they want to say it's green because the culture of the company is to uh, over focus on red. And so I don't want to I don't want to put a red number up because I'm going to have everyone riding me on that. So even if they knew the answer, which is very questionable, uh, they're going to bias what they report. And so the result is a lot of surprises. And what you consistently heard from general managers is the honest answer is between signing a contract and a renewal date coming up, they are completely blind. And it's only when they get into a renewal sure. cycle. And of course, going in couple with that is the idea that mitigating problems becomes very expensive and difficult as you go further and further down the contract. So an issue that might occur in the first six months of life of a contract could be quite resolvable. But if you resolve it during some sort of renewal cycle, it's almost certainly very expensive, very difficult. It might not prevent an RFP. So a very simple idea at the end of the day is, is this account that's up for renewal six months from now or 12 months from now or 18 months from now, what's the probabilistic outcome that they renew? And if you can get to something that is at the very least informing the team from an analytic perspective, then surely you know, that's, that's a huge change in the likelihood that you can do something. Yeah, I think it's empowering to those teams. I think it's not disparaging them to say that they have a, a bit of a bias and they also have a very limited capacity to make a prediction like that because really the, they're limited to the anecdotes that they're personally experiencing with a customer. And oftentimes those anecdotes, 
are not with the buyer. They're not even with the end user. They're oftentimes at a point of engagement with a project team that themselves may be kind of disconnected from some of the stuff that you can you can see when you're looking at evidence-based predictions. So with new models, what we're able to do is go look at all of the signals that are percolating up from end users who are using products or touching products. And you know we can combine those with some of the attitude data we've seen in the past to make predictions about the future. And one of the most empowering things about this is the ability to make relatively short-term practical uh, decisions better using this data than you could with NPS. It, imagine in the old world where you have only a survey-based NPS program and maybe you have a 10% response rate. And if I come to you and I say, what, what can you tell me about at-risk revenue in the next two quarters of our business? Well, at best, 10% of that sample might be in the next couple of quarters, right? So the, the overlap is so tiny that it becomes very difficult. So what, what you end up with is a kind of a CX program where satisfaction and NPS are sort of seen as attitudes that we look at very infrequently to just sort of see the cumulative effects of what all we're doing. Well, once you start to dial the data in differently like this, you can actually live and work in the moment. You can work at the operating rhythm that those financial metrics are looked at. They're looked at every week, every day, every month, every quarter. Uh, and so you bring CX into that picture and you just really have a complete sea change with how you can work. Yeah. Well, it's a reflection of the fact that the origin of CX data was very much consumer. And if you're dealing with extrapolation of relatively small samples to large groups and consumer, that kind of worked. It, it sort of worked in the 1980s and the 1990s. And there was mm -hmm. never really much thought put into B2B where you had highly heterogeneous groups of customers. And so we just kept extrapolating. We said, okay, you got 20% survey response rates or 15%. They're individuals, by the way, they're not even accounts, so they might be the wrong people, but let's extrapolate to the whole group and conclude right. that the group is healthy or the group is unhealthy. And it never worked terribly well. I mean, you and I have been involved in thousands of these things, and truth, truth be told, you're always out on a huge limb making the case that any of these numbers represented health of the customer base. And it was always mm -hmm. obsolete because right. the data changed. So I think the ability to now get down to the account level and equally important to the level of health that is current, as in right now, last month, is instrumental. But one of the questions I get asked most of the time, and I'd love your answer on this, is if you're taking operational data and you're using that to essentially build CX analytics, and then you're using the CX analytics to project forward to financial outcomes, why do you need to even bother with CX analytics, right? Why not take operational data mm -hmm. and use that to project financial outcomes? Why not skip the, the whole CX narrative in the first place? Yeah, I think it's a it's a it's a nuanced answer, but I'll, I'll I would put it this way to begin with: it puts you on uh, with the, when you use the CX data, you're going to principally uh, structure all the data you're looking at relative to the customer. So you're going to start with a customer journey and you're going to take all those operational metrics. In our case, sometimes in the platform that we've built, we might take 800, 900 different data objects from five, six, seven different systems and use them to make predictive models. But what we begin to do is we sort of organize them in the way a customer thinks of it. So it, we're, we're anchoring them on a journey uh, and then when we're decoupling that, or maybe I should say decoding that, and we're looking at the KPIs that are driving predictions, let's say it's about the customer satisfaction with a buying experience. Um, it's really useful to know the relative impact of those things on the buying experience. So you begin to build this attribution chain that's actionable at the bottom. So you can really see, well, relatively, uh, the customer was unhappy with this particular thing. It's driving a bad buying outcome, which is in turn dri driving a bad overall attitude. Uh, and we think is a real risk for how they'll behave commercially. So I, I now have an attribution chain. I can go actually work on things that I know will have an effect because when I change those values in our model and, and predict again, they're going to, you know, they're going to change the prediction. So it, it allows you to do that. And I think it's it was very difficult, if not impossible, with traditional survey data. I mean, I, I would I would tell people and I tell them this all the time, 
that the surveys are really great uh, and they're really irreplaceable for certain things. So really getting to an attitude. What is your attitude in general about things? And then maybe some decomposition of that attitude on a couple of levels. So if I said, well, what was your overall attitude? What is your attitude about buying? And then maybe I can get you to answer two or three more elements about the buying experience. Not 800, you know, like we're pulling out a data system. So they're, they're very limited in, in that way. Yeah, I think there's another aspect to this that's often overlooked. If you're, if you're running a large organization and you're signaling to the organization and you want every employee to get aligned around a few key ideas, um, I think going to the organization and saying, you know, we're going to get very excited because we've identified some correlations between certain operational metrics and retention is not the way you run a company. It's not the way you get, uh, you know, shareholders, employees, even the stock market excited. You go out and say, we are fundamentally committed to the, this idea that in the long term, if we deliver a superior customer experience, uh, we will, that will advantage our business. That's a little bit of an article of faith, but it's also based on some pretty good data that suggests that in the long run, these are the companies that win. Uh, and so if you're going to go out and say that, you, to some extent, you have to tie your operational programs to those CX outcomes. You can't simply ignore the fact that the customer is at the center of that. If you sort of cut the That's customer right. out, then you run the risk of coming up with these formulas which increasingly distance you from the reality of how your customers perceive the business. And then it becomes a financial optimization. Now, mm -hmm. I'm not suggesting companies shouldn't do some form of financial optimization, but in the medium to long term, if all you do is continue to financially optimize, you're gonna draw a lot of conclusions about how to run your business that distances you from the way your customers perceive you. And I think a lot of senior leaders understand this intuitively. Um, it, it's a bit, it seems like a bit arcane when you're looking at data sets and you think, well, I can, I can use these data sets in different ways. But I think at the end of the day, if you're gonna make the customer part of your strategy, you're gonna have to run your operations to create good customer outcomes. No, I think that's exactly right. And I think the best companies know that and they, they're always trying to bias their decision making at, in that direction. I think what what has happened now is we're we're able to in, in such a data rich environment as we live in today, we're able to empower them to do that in a better way. Look, the marketing guys figured this out a long time ago. The acquisition guys, uh, they they understood very quickly that not all of your customers are the same and not all of them will behave the same. And so they, they've really sort of taken the idea of, of personalization uh, all the way out to the level of concierge level presentation of, va of value propositions. And I think what's what's been lagging is how we treat our customers once they're our customers. And they're not all the same. And so when you look at, you know, let's say a, a heroic extrapolation from a survey and you make decisions about that, well, that may be the kind of common denominator sentiment but it may vary greatly in pockets of the business. If you have a, a high touch portion of the business and a low touch portion of the business, high ticket, low ticket, um, onshore, offshore, lots of differences can make really, really meaningful uh, uh, kinds of changes in the way the experience is driving the outcome. And so I think until you have complete data sets and until those data sets are flowing continuously, you're gonna have a hard time making better decisions day to day. And I think that's what the world offers us up now. And I think you, you're probably hearing that as you're out there talking to customers running traditional programs. I'd be interested to hear you talk a little bit about, you know, what the world looks like to the, the kind of renaissance CX leader who's striving for what's going to come next and what they're looking for when they're asking those questions. Yeah, I think that, you know, as you said, there's, there's, not every CX program is breaking new ground, right? I mean, you still have people who are doing very basic programs that we would recognize from 15 years ago, and it's relatively novel for the company they're doing it with. But I think, uh, I think that the companies that are looking more uh, forward-looking now have been struggling with this data issue for some time. In many ways, it's impeded their ability to create credibility, both in terms of generating insight, 
it's certainly massively impeded in B2B the ability to get the engagement of the sales teams or the customer facing teams. I mean, at the end of the day, yeah. saying once a year we're going to give you 10% of your accounts is, is basically worthless data to customer facing employees, right? And mm -hmm. if, if the company pushes the idea strongly enough, people will pay lip service to it. They'll say, sure, I'll do a closed loop exercise once a year. That's great. Are we done yet? Uh, but there's no right. engagement. And so I think people have identified the problem. What I think is new is we're still playing catch up, realizing that there are solutions. And I think it's dawning on the market slowly that there are solutions. You know, everyone jokes about the old story about Henry Ford and customers would want faster horses. Well, mm -hmm. there are a lot of, there's a lot of ways in which the CX industry has been working for the last decade to build faster and faster horses. How do we slightly tune the way we do surveys uh, so that they look more visually complete? How do we streamline our integration with CRM so that we can issue surveys more easily? How do we fine tune closed loop? Well, all of that is basically taking a, you know, a, a five mile per hour animal and trying to find ways to make it six miles per hour. Ironically, to stretch the metaphor, the horse is getting slower and slower. It's going down to four, going down to three. Um, and to some extent, the problem is we're now coming into this universe from a data science perspective, from a predictive analytics perspective, and saying, look, the horse isn't the medium of travel anymore. I've got a Tesla over yeah. here. And people right. are sort of looking sideways at it going, what on earth are you on about? I, I'm, I'm surrounded by horse salespeople telling me that they can get me a faster horse. So yeah. I think this is true of any industry. It's true with any technology. I think what we're seeing now is people recognize the problem. I think it's going to take a little more imagination for most of them to realize that there are new solutions. And then we're going to see the, the, the S curve that's typical in all these forms of adoption. Early adopters are going out and getting breakthrough results and they will lead the market and they will be the case studies. And then eventually the mass market will catch up. But I think honestly, if today you're starting a CX program and your first instinct is to do a once a year or twice a year relationship study, you should ask yourself the question, that is a technique that, I mean, look, we wrote about that technique in our book 2008. So we've got 14 years since that was a valid practice in the industry. I mean, yeah. I just can't imagine that that's, uh, that that's going to motivate people. Uh, so perhaps this is a good place to sort of, to sort of leave on. So what, maybe you could summarize at the end by, by telling everybody you know, having now been looking at this mechanism for connecting all of these CX metrics into these retention data points, net revenue retention, you know, what, what's been your biggest takeaway, maybe even the biggest surprise you've had or, or big lesson you've learned from the whole thing? Sure. Yeah, I think probably they, they kind of cascade down. I mean, the first one is probably that if the, the, the survey is really good at understanding what constitutes negative, neutral, or positive sentiment. And that's very difficult to get elsewhere. You have to sort of ask someone, how do you feel? You know, it's sort of uh, uh, the question that has to be asked, and it can be asked in better or worse ways. What it's really terrible at, though, and I think this surprised us, is uh, it's so sensitive to composition of sample that almost everywhere I go, once we run uh, a model that scores all customers, the NPS score has been wildly wrong. It's been usually, not always, but usually it's vastly underrepresenting the number of detractors uh, or negative sentiment in your population because, of course, they're probably least likely to answer the survey. Uh, in some cases, they might be the most most anxious to answer the survey with some fairly colorful language, but but most of the time they're underrepresented. So that was a big surprise. And then as we kind of look down into how we're producing the models, now keep in mind in predictive analytics, we're we're regularly seeing accuracy rates between 75 and 85 percent on the predictions that we're making, and uh, that is to most data scientists so good it's suspect to business buyers who on one hand may be just trusting the gut instinct of a sales guy on whether the forecast is 50% or 80% likely, they still have trouble, I think, moving into this probabilistic world. So that's been a learning for us. Uh, I don't know if it's a surprise, but I think we're still 
learning how to people how to land people there. Um, you know, how much of this do they want to know and do they want to take on faith from trusted people they're asking to look into it and how much of it needs to be part of the general conversation? So those are a couple of big things that have that stick out to me as we're making this journey. Yeah, I think I think that issue about the fact that extrapolation doesn't work the way people think it does. Yeah. When you explain that to people, it's pretty obvious. You have a heterogeneous customer group. Uh, and I had this conversation recently where someone said, well, you just need to modify your sample until you get an accurate representation yeah. of the customer group. I'm like, you barely have any responses. What are you going to do? Cut out 20, 30 percent of them so that you massage it. And right. the fact is, business to business, for sure, is highly heterogeneous, even in B2C. You have yep. micro segments of customers that you want to slice and dice that become heterogeneous behavior groups. We, we've got this technology, if you like, called extrapolation. It's a mathematical technique from the 60s. It was mm -hmm. great in its day, but there's no need anymore. And I think your point is you get 75%, 85% accuracy. Why on earth would you want to extrapolate when you can predict? Essentially, prediction is the next generation of technology past extrapolation. And... Um, Perhaps that's a good point to leave mm -hmm. it on. Brian, thanks very much. Really enjoyed the webinar. Hope everyone right. else did. And, yeah. um, uh, and uh, look forward to getting more feedback from people on this. Great. Thanks.